Hi, class. Uh, I've got a PowerPoint that talks about negative space and figure and ground relationships. And I would like to share that with you. Um, I'm going to do it through Zoom because it's easier for you guys to grab that video on Canvas than download a giant PowerPoint. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay. All right, so positive and negative space, uh, basically shapes and how they relate to each other. Figure and ground are terms that you hear often in painting and drawing, um, which also relate to positive and negative shapes. So we're gonna learn that vocabulary a bit. Space, the element of art that refers to the objects or figures in a work of art or the emptiness or area between, around, above, below, and within those figures or objects. Positive space is generally the shapes, forms, and figures in two-dimensional and three-dimensional art aka the figure. The positive space is generally the subject. It's considered to be the subject of a representational painting. So the flower pot, the person, the you know car, whatever it is a painting of or drawing of. So in this example, the girl is considered the positive space, the subject of the painting. Negative space is the empty spaces, the surrounding shapes, forms, and figures, also called the ground. Um, so in this uh, Manet painting, the positive space would be the figures, the four people, the dog, right, in the foreground. The negative space is everything else but the yellow ground that you literally it's the floor um that you see in this painting and if you look at it in terms of that yellow space all being an actual shape or part of the painting and not something that's just behind the figures you really can start to get a sense of how important negative space is to artists because really there's more so-called negative space in this painting than positive space. And so how we control that, arrange it, compose it, um, color it, everything um, is gonna really uh, help the viewer understand the so-called subject of the painting. In this case, the, the landscape is really another character in this painting. Okay, here's a drawing. Um, the negative space in this drawing would be what? How about the space between the model's head and arms? So um, those sort of organic shapes that are not head and are not forearm or shoulder, they're kind of soft triangles. Those would be the negative space all of the sort of linen canvas uh, or paper would be negative space, this sort of beigey paper. Um, but then look at the tank top, right? So that's drawn as contour line and it is left open as negative space, but it's part of the subject. So it would be neg uh, positive space as well. So in this case, this artist is kind of taking on and dealing with just those ideas. This is a finished work, it's signed. So the artist wanted that sort of flatness and modeling and the sort of shifting between, well, what layer is the negative space here? But what we can say for sure is that those closed enclosed spaces between the arms and the head and then all of the surrounding rectangle are very clear negative spaces. But I think this is quite lovely. In this case, the flower silhouette shapes are the positive space and the white is the negative space. It's important to know that negative and positive space are not generally a color. So 
a lot of times when you're doing exercises in negative space, the negative space will be kind of drawn out, you know, blocked out with your pencil as a black or charcoal color. And then the positive space is left to the open paper, which is basically usually white. Um, but really, it's not about the tones or the values. It's about the surrounding shape and the subject shape. So here you can see that in like describing the small leaves in the lower right hand quadrant, those tiny triangular white shapes that go between the stem and the leaves really help describe that. So it's not just sort of a clump of black. You understand that it's sort of multiple leaves pressed together. In this um, painting, the negative space would be the waterfall, right? Which is primarily the substrate of the paper um, that this is created on. And then the monkeys and the cliff sides are the positive space. So in this case, the negative space is clearly at least a third of the artwork and it is down the center of the page. So it's not always just around the outside edges, right? It could go right through the middle. And then there's further negative space. If you look up in the right-hand quadrant, right? Underneath the leaves um, and you see tree branches, there's those black shapes. Well, that's truly negative space. So when you look at those, well, then all of a sudden the water fall becomes positive space. And so you see, it's actually this layering within a composition. It's not always completely flat and just two things. Things flip between being positive and negative space within a composition, depending on the com complexity and the depth of the composition. All right, here's a junky old chair, like maybe so many of us might have languishing in our backyards. And the chair in this image is positive space. And here it is as negative space. So what's different? Well, it's flattened. All the details are taken off the surface of the chair. And it's really an image of the black shapes and where the black shapes leave space for the white shapes. So by simplifying it in this way, we can really see the negative shapes, but the negative shapes are just as much there in the photo on the left. But why, another reason it's so important for artists to start harness, recognizing and harnessing the power of negative space is that a lot of perspectival problems we have, making a person look like they're sitting down or that things are not floating above a table, but are on the table. Chairs are also sort of, known to be kind of challenging to draw because of the perspective of the seat and the legs and the arms of the chair. In this case, if you use negative space and you really carefully observe the shapes of the space and you really don't worry about anything about perspective or calculating angles, you just really try to capture those spaces, you'll be more than halfway there um, to getting a uh, proper perspective. So it's a wonderful problem solver. So when you look at the image on the right, one, notice that the chair only has three legs. Now, if we were going with what we know about chairs, our assumptions, which is what all humans do, especially adults, we would, if we were drawing this chair from our imagination, we would very likely include the fourth leg because we know right? The chairs have four legs. I mean, unless they're those little three-legged stools, but leave that out, right? Chairs have four legs. So we're left to our imagination. If we're going to describe a chair, we're going to describe four legs. But actually, this chair, the angle that we're observing this chair from, we can't see that fourth leg. And that is more true than the truth of our assumption about chairs. And that's where drawing from actual observation and really looking at negative space is the most important thing. Also note, look at the length of the chair legs. They're a little bit different, right? That's the other thing that our uh, you know really smart brain that says, well, I'm an adult, I know all about chairs, would probably correct, in quotes, correct, 
if we were drawing this from our imagination or even from observation, would probably bust their way in there to sort of cut off what we were seeing and replace it with an idea of chair that we have. Because, right, if a chair has uneven leg lengths, it's going to be a wobbly chair. So we would never want to draw a wobbly chair, right? We want it to feel real and solid. But the fact is, because of perspective, the chair leg lengths look different and they actually hit the floor at different points. So these three chair legs are actually pretty much the same length, but as they're positioned around the chair, they appear to be different lengths and the, where the feet meet the ground are on different planes, right? The two front legs are on the same diagonal li line, but we very often would take, if we were substituting what we know instead of what we see, we would take that back leg and lengthen it down so that it would be on the same plane as the front legs. And that would be incorrect, but that's what our brain would want us to do if we weren't really trusting what we saw. Okay, the sky is the negative space. Even when it's blue, it's still the negative space, but by making it black and dropping the details of the clouds out, it's more clear to see. Designers also um, use negative space because it's a way that you can add more information without uh, more clutter or more objects or more words, right? In a, in a limited space, in a logo, for example, you can pack it with information, ways to read it. So FedEx here, if you look between the E and the X, you see that the negative space between those two letters forms an arrow you know, pointing forward, right? Well, that's what they do. They go, they deliver, they go from point A to point B with your stuff. So the designer was able to use typography and negative space to add a another layer of information into a very clean and simple logo. Here's some more logos that demonstrate that, maybe not quite as well, but there you go. Um, the Kulner Zoo, the space under the elephant's chin and trunk is a giraffe. The space between the front legs and the back legs is a rhino. And the space between the two back legs is like a crocodile head, right? Uh, the Bronx Zoo similarly, except that um, the negative spaces between the giraffe's legs are uh, the city skyline. Here's a negative space drawing from a drawing class. And it's a plant, an airplane plant or spider plant, right? Um, in a pot and the pot is in a saucer and it's on some sort of square stacks. The negative space is black. And so you can see that by um, pretty carefully delineating the shapes and the gaps between the leaves, we have the whole description of that plant um, and the gesture of it. Here's another design where the negative space um, in the handle, right, becomes a face in profile and the top of the cup becomes a speech bubble. Now this is a little bit more like the waterfall um, ink painting that we looked at in that the milk here, spilled milk, is the, perhaps the negative space or perhaps the positive space, right? So that emptiness, you might say, well, that's negative if it's empty, but it definitely is the subject of the drawing. So it becomes positive and all the wood grain is the negative space. In a non-objective, or um, also sometimes called abstract art or non-representational art, where there's not a noun in the art, there's not a person, place, or thing. It's about the process, the material, and the thing itself, the brush strokes, the brush, the paint. Um, in this Franz Klein painting, there's still positive and negative space, even if the shapes that we're looking at are not a picture 
a representational picture. So in this case, the positive space could very well be the white or the black, but there is a clear differentiation between the spaces. I personally see the black spaces as the positive space and the white spaces as the negative space, but there's more thickness in the white spaces. So I could see how some folks would see that as the positive space. In this drawing, sometimes negative space, not always utilized by artists that it fills the whole rectangular format and it's just sort of a solid black or white or color shape. Sometimes it's just used for emphasis. So in this case, the crank part of the C clamp, right? If you squint at that, you can see that all the dark marks around it really make activate the space and you can see the specificity and the detail in that drawing um, in a way that's really vital. And, but the artist doesn't do that around the whole C clamp. Matter of fact, the clamp kind of disappears at the top, but that's not where he wants us to look right up there at the top. He really wants you to focus or he, where he himself was focusing um, where the um, mechanism of the clamp is. This is a classic example that you'll see many times in any talk about negative space, but this Reuben vase, also called figure and ground. So negative space and positive space is one way of talking about this figure and ground is another. And I have to say, it seems mostly in painting classes and figure, literally figure drawing classes, you will hear people say figure and ground a lot more than negative space. The figure is the positive and the ground is the negative, the surrounding space. So on the left, you have a yellow um, goblet. And on the right, the goblet is removed and you see just the negative space. So you see two, the profiles, two profiles facing each other. Right, so that flipping as your mind's eye moves between seeing the goblet and seeing the faces is the power of positive and negative space. That sort of movement that you feel between the two is what we're after. And if you look back at the yellow goblet, you can quite clearly see the faces facing each other in white, right? But you may not have noticed them as faces until the yellow and the detail on the surface of the goblet was removed. Now, a lot of artists don't want clear figure and ground relationships or clear positive and negative space. That flipping from positive to negative, that sort of clear definition um, is something they wanna interrogate. And so artists like Cezanne who painted in the 18th century an impressionist he was careful in some of his paintings to really break down the figure and ground and make it ambiguous, meaning that it kind of vibrates between the two. So you can see that there's maybe rocks or bushes shapes in the foreground, which is the lower part of the painting. It's the um, landscape here and some sort of trees move through the back, but the blue shapes between the tree trunks or branches kind of push more forward than most of the trunks. Um, the sort of cliff side over here kind of um, also shifts uh, between seeming kind of like realism or maybe like it's an unfinished painting of something else. And that tension you feel where your eye is trying to resolve it, it's like it's slightly out of focus and you're trying to focus it. Um, that tension, that awareness of your vision um, and the processes of vision is something that the Impressionists were very interested in because they were very interested in optics. So this artist intentionally broke the rule of having clear and resolved figure and ground relationships in order to interrogate that practice. So you kind of have to know sort of these, whether they're rules or just um, modes that, you know, that we have learned, received knowledge, you need to kind of know them to understand how to um, undermine them, shall we say. All right, here's a photograph I took of just some leaves. 
right? And the negative space is the blue sky. You can see the black and white branches back there breaking up that negative space as well. When I remove the color of the leaves and the white of the branches, then you can see that blue negative space even better. And the little, you see the tiniest shapes of it, like right where the uh, leaf, upper leaf on the diagonal meets the stem, there's a tiny blue gap in there. That sort of specificity of negative shape, you can see if you can observe that as carefully as that, that's where you'll really get some accuracy um, and realism in your work. But also you can see when you do this, how balanced the negative and positive spaces are. You know, if you were to smush together all the blue and, you know, figure out the percentage of blue pixels to black pixels in this, I feel like it would probably be pretty equal. If this has a lot, it's very balanced, even though the blue is divided up into several smaller shapes, I think overall it equals about the same as the black. Here's a contemporary artist called Devin Suno, works in Los Angeles. His paintings, he uses aerosol or spray paint. Um, and so he uses kind of, you know, graffiti painting techniques, but he combines them with traditional Japanese painting techniques, which he says really reflects his childhood and life of growing up in Los Angeles as a Japanese American contemporary person. And he, he uses stencils and layers them very carefully to create these um, deep and beautiful um, paintings. But you can see just looking at this that, wow, this guy really uses negative space and positive space and is very aware of figure and ground relationships to make this complex visual collage really sing and make sense. And what's interesting, these California seedlings, these are all bits of plants that grow natively in California and very often along the LA river, which he grew up playing and fishing in the LA river, which is kind of a concrete channel in downtown LA. Um, but he talks about this idea about urban nature and rural nature and what nature counts as real nature. And he also has all of these plants brought together as though they might grow and coexist. But actually, you know, some of these are introduced species and some are native and some are weeds and some are flowers. And so it's kind of also talking about how um, cultures come together and thrive in uh, the or can in the contemporary world and this is i uh, used to run this art gallery and so for a project with devin we uh, put one of his paintings on the outside of the building which is pretty spectacular sculpture also utilizes positive and negative space so this alexander calder the red steel of the sculpture is the positive but look how activated the landscape becomes looking at it through these shapes. And if you were to walk around the sculpture, those wedges of landscape would look very different as the shapes changed as your angle to them did. So artists, sculptors activate negative space, which is our environment uh, by their sculpture. So he very much utilizes the negative and positive space to make his statement, even though it's a very abstract or non-objective sculpture. That's it. Okay, I'm gonna stop the share. Okay, so um, that's the positive and negative space information that I wanted you to have. And I hope um, that you find that intriguing um, and we will continue to work with positive and negative space as we continue the semester. Thanks.